morning, church. Good morning, fathers. We'll forget mothers today. Ah, uh, no. To your detriment, Heidi says. How is everyone? It's good to be home. Uh, it's good to see your faces. And uh, wow, I can see also we have quite a few visitors here today. Uh, we have friends from England, all the way from England. And we especially welcome you. Thank you for coming. And I see my friend Ebad up over there. Ebad, you, you, I could not miss you today. I'm so glad you are here. Um, and everybody else. Uh, well, why don't we do what we always do, and that is please turn around and just smile and say hello to one another. Warm this place up, even though it's warm outside. We are doing the series on, on the favorite Bible characters, and I chose, well, he's, he's not my favorite, but one of them, and that's Joseph. So I'm going to share with you three sermons on, on, on Joseph, and I entitled this one, The Seemingly Absent God and the Gospel. There are a number of instances in the life of Joseph where you almost kind of break into understanding and say, hey, where is God here? Can't see him. Kind of when, when he's needed the most, he's not there. It's just not one instance. It's number of instances. But then there are people out there who say, isn't, that, isn't God doing a bad job? So many be bad things happen in the world, and where is he? Maybe you have that personal question of yours, and that is, yeah, where was he? Or where is he now? When I need him the most. I think Joseph grappled with that question. And he went through that question successfully and answered it with his life. So let's read the text first, and then we'll get into it. Now Israel, I want you to see that it doesn't say Jacob. Israel, and look at the sentence after that. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. Israel, trouble, trouble. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him off his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing, and they took him and they threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty, there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. The camels were loaded with spices, balm and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah had said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hand on him. After all, he's our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. 
where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered the goat, and dipped the robe into the blood. They took the ornamented robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn up to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son for many days. This is just portion of a story. And we are going to base this, this topic today on half of the story of Joseph. But well, let's, let's start again. Probably one of the biggest arguments that people out there have, as far as God is concerned, is his apparent absence, especially in the moment of the greatest need. And they come and conclude and say they, that he's not doing a good job. In other words, for many people, it's not even a question whether God exists or not, but whether this God is a good God. And this goodness of God should be proved in the greatest hour of people's need, and that doesn't seem to work. That's the charge, and the charge is heavy. People out there ask the question. People inside may ask the same question, and it's not easy to answer. So there are three things we are going to look at today. The number one is the hidden reality of sin. Number two, the hidden purposes of God. And number three is the hidden display of the grace of God. Let's start with number one, the hidden reality of sin. I mean, the charge that I placed before you is real. And we especially feel it when we go through the valley of the shadow of death. And each one either was or is or will be in the valley. So we feel, all of us feel it. But before we talk about this, we need to address the question in the background. The question that kind of frames the whole thing in a very proper way. And that is what I call the hidden reality of sin. From time to time I go deep sea fishing. And I remember a time, it was a night time, and the ocean was as flat as you can imagine it. And that's ideal. You love the flat ocean. If you don't want to contend with seasickness, you see. But when I threw the line, the line just, just went. Instead of dropping down, it just disappeared. What happened? You know what happened. The current just simply took it. So on the surface of things, this water was perfectly calm, but underneath, it's a different story. Also, there are mountains out there that look solid, serene, immovable. But specialists realize that under some of those mountains, there is this raging lava ready to explode. In other words, things are not as they seem. I'm looking at you. You're all nicely dressed. Everything seems to be fine. You all got it together. But here you are in families or individually, and something is brewing underneath. A gasket may soon just explode. 
and the things will get together and it won't be nice. Maybe it's happening now in your life. So before we talk about the apparent hiddenness of God and seemingly upset God, we need to frame it within, within the reality of a human life. And for most of us, for all of us, very often we are caught in a web. That's not nice. And we don't know how to get out of. The hidden reality of sin, we are caught in the web of it. And we come to the end of ourselves and get stuck and we don't know how to get unstuck. And this is what was going on with the life of Jacob and his family. Let's start. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. I want you to see, I don't know if this was a coincidence that the author of the Bible is calling him Israel rather than Jacob. Who is Israel? What, is, what does the name Israel mean? The one who is? Hey? Who fought with God and succeeded. Victorious one. A newborn person. But look at him. Look at him. He loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. A newborn guy. And that's where the trouble started. But let's dig a little deeper and see the background of it. Jacob was growing up desperately longing for his father's Isaac love, which he never received. Well, that's at least how he felt. Because his father loved his brother more than him. The tragedy of the story is that when Jacob left, he never saw his father again and, left, and was left with an empty feeling and unsatisfied desire for his father's love. The story doesn't end there. He means a young lady. She is stunningly attractive. He, once he laid his eye on her, he would pursue her because she was going to be her, his savior, Rachel. If I have Rachel, that will fix my life. No wonder for 14 years he would work hard. He was so persistent. Something was missing in his life. And now Rachel was going to fix it. Really? The story doesn't end up there. What an irony. His favorite wife dies. And now her son becomes Jacob's emotional anchor. Now, Joseph is... Jacob is fixated on Joseph, Rachel's son. And he, as you know, he gave him this richly ornamented robe. Joseph became the idol of Jacob's life. Do you see the web of sin, how it is working itself out? Things that were not resolved and now others are being caught up in it. So what's the main problem? This poison, this whole thing poisoned Jacob's entire family. Well, look at it now from Joseph's side. Look what it says in the Bible, in verse 2. He brought then father a bad report about them. Remember the story? They were farmers, they were peasants, and they had livestock. 
and his brothers would tend to those, the livestock. And then Jacob would send Joseph to give them food, to bring them food. And then Joseph would come back. And the Bible says that he would bring bad reports about his brothers to the father. Now, some commentators observed something really interesting about this word bad. This word bad in Hebrew is ha'afsa, which is really, when literally translated, means false or misrepresentation. So what Joseph was doing, he was not giving the full truth, but potentially half of the truth and misrepresenting reality so that the father was told not the full truth about his other sons. What a brat. So Joseph is not handling the truth well. And obviously his brothers were not happy with him for misrepresenting them. But then there is this dream. Not one, but two. And you know the dream. Most of you do. All these individual sheaves that he saw in his dream. And these sheaves belonged to each brother. And these sheaves were bowing down individually to Joseph and the, and the interpretation was obvious. Not only this, but also their fathers. So he tells them. Very insensitively. Just as a matter of fact. They said, really? So we have to bow down to you? Not only us, but your father too? The Bible says that after Joseph told them his first dream, they were furious. But after he told them the second dream, which was pretty much the same, the Bible says they hated him. They hated him. Do you see the dynamic? Do you see the progression? Do you see the web? Do you see the hiddenness of sin start, starting to play up? Starting to be deepened? Catching them all in its web? Hatred. And Jacob sees what is going on. He's starting to lose control. Relationships are starting to be fractured. Things are not going well. Before we talk about the hiddenness of God, we need to see and perceive the hiddenness and hideousness of sin. So Joseph is totally insensitive how his behavior impacts others. He became an arrogant and cruel person. He brings false reports arrogantly. He shares dreams insensitively. And he was becoming a spoiled, selfish, insensitive, arrogant, and potentially bad person. It's all happening. Jacob is starting to see what is going on, but he's losing control. The hatred settled in in his sons, other sons. Joseph is arrogant, insensitive. And the gasket is about to blow off. Now, from the perspective of brothers, what they observed, just, just think from their point of view. They observed how Jacob had a greater love for Rachel than their mother. How would you feel? Their mother was being neglected. How would kids feel? <coughs> Jacob's greater love for Joseph and Benjamin. How would you feel? 
Joseph lies. Joseph is arrogant. Hatred seems to be a normal outcome. Verses 4, 5, and 8, they all say they hated him. They hated him. They hated him. You see? So behind a nice, prosperous family, we discover brokenness and sin. And the whole family is going to be destroyed if somebody does not intervene. And it's not easy to disentangle. It's not easy to get unstuck. It's not easy to resolve the problem. Things are deep. And as I speak to you, as you think of yourself, as you think of your family, you know the complexity of it. You know the problem. You don't have the problem as much as I do, you would say. Because you really know how deep things can get. And how hard it is to untangle. When you get stuck, how hard it is to unstuck. That's what happens. It happens outside there. It happens inside. It happens with a person who is called Israel. Bitterness. Pride. Brokenness. Jealousy, hatred, running deep in Israel's family. So before we talk about the absence of God and hiddenness of God, we are to talk about hideousness and hiddenness of sin that works its way and entangles and traps and you get stuck. You see, the gospel, the purpose of a Bible, so when I love and I read that kind of a story. The Bible doesn't give you rule after rule or the way how you prescriptively now can resolve a problem. It just gives you a story. Because it reflects the reality. Our stories reflect reality. Baba's purpose is to show us how God's grace breaks into our lives and saves us from the sin and brokenness. The same thing happens with Joseph. I want you to see that sin and grace run in every family. I don't want you to say amen here because... I can, you can say especially about grace, but it's true. Sin and grace run in every family. Very often we say that it's your choices that brought you to the place where you are, whether good or bad, and to a certain extent, that statement is true, but it's not fully true. The larger reality is that we are part of relationships. And the reason why we behave the way we behave is because of relationships that have gone sour and broken. So bad relationships get us into trouble, but relationship will also get us out of it. And so when you read the story, you will find that it will be resolved through relationships, both with God and with one another. Yes, it is choices. But yes, most of all, it is God behind the scenes and the grace of God that breaks through and untangles the web of sin that brought us into a trouble and we don't know how to get unstuck. That's really ultimately what counts and what makes the difference. So let's talk now about the hidden purposes of God. 
So under the surface, as we said, there is a tragedy of sin, but there is also God at work. I pray for you and for myself. You yourself know what is going on in your life. You yourself know what is going on in your family. You yourself know how you got stuck and you don't know how to get unstuck. And all you are fixated on is the tragedy of a problem you find yourself in. But may I turn your attention to the beauty of the grace of God that will work behind the scene to untangle you, to untangle you, to bring relationships back into order, to give glory to God. So the hidden purposes of God will be fulfilled in the lives of this family to two things that we find in the text. Number one is the dreams and what I call random coincidences. Let's look at it. Suddenly, this spoiled child has a dream. And it's from none other but God himself. But a strange dream. And then placed against the cultural background, it, it looks really strange. In traditional societies, younger always bows down to older. And in a dream, it's the other way around. So he tells them, just blurts out those dreams to his brothers. They say, what? Children bow down to parents, no matter the age. The oldest always gets greater share of estate. And you are telling us now that the younger one will be bowed down to even father. This was God's way going against the traditional culture to save the family. Joseph's dream was radically socially unacceptable. Totally unacceptable. God gave Joseph a dream which was going to save them from two things. And I want you to see it. Don't miss this. From a famine, to physically perish, but also from sin to spiritually perish. With one shot, two major problems resolved in his life or in their life. God was working behind the scene and nobody was realizing that God had his web. Now, let's look at the coincidences. The story shows us a series of coincidences that happen in Joseph's life. Let's remind ourselves. I know you know the story, but I want you to see it with fresh new eyes. Jacob sends Joseph to see his brothers who were grazing the herds at Shechem, but they just happened to decide not to stay at Shechem, but to go to Dotham. Follow that. Now, Joseph just happened to come to the place where they had been and just happened to run into a stranger who just happened to have met his brothers and overheard them saying that they were going to Dotham. I want you to think of the instances in your life where it just happened. I've had many of those. It just happened. But God is... Working behind the scenes. And it just happened. A coincidence. When brothers who hated Joseph grabbed hold of him, Reuben, who just happened to be there, saved him from 
being killed, but just happened not to be there to save him from being sold into captivity. Just a coincidences. If everything that happened did not happen exactly in the way it did, and just in that order, everybody dies. A famine was coming, and if Joseph was not in the position of power in Egypt, everyone would die. God, working his way around in the background, trying to untangle the family that is in a web and entrapped in sin and problem. Every single of these coincidences were really not coincidences because if any of them did not happen, not only does the whole family die, but the entire messianic line would die too. Do you see that? What does it all mean? All along, God is not even mentioned. He's apparently absent. He never speaks. Doesn't seem to be doing anything. Seems to be fully absent. But is that the case? Though God seems to be fully absent on the surface, he still is managing down to a small detail what happens in all those, in all those chaotic, terrible things that seem to make no sense. He's in the background. Working. God was arranging things for the salvation of the family. Do you believe that God is in the background trying to solve your mess. Amen. Hello. Only a few said amen. And I understand you don't want to expose yourself by saying amen, yeah? But it's true. Apparently absent God is working behind the scene trying to solve your mess and my mess. Well, you can say amen now. <laughs> but it's true. Praise be to God. And you know what? He, he takes a back seat and doesn't want to be given accolades. He just works hard to undo what we have missed. And eventually, if we allow him, he will succeed. If we allow him, he will succeed. So what do we learn here? This is probably the most important statement I'm making today. And it's this. God's redeeming love is compatible with bad things that happen to us. Hello. Are you ready to say that? Okay. God's redeeming love is compatible with bad things that happen to us. Look at this. So when Joseph came to be his brothers, they stripped him of his robe. They took him and threw him into the cistern. Don't keep me in here. Help me, God. He was crying out of the pit. In the darkness. And there was no answer. There was no answer. Didn't come. They seized him. They stripped him. They threw him naked. They abandoned him. They sc he screamed. But there's no rescue. Does this remind you of somebody else? Yeah, exactly. Through the pain and suffering came salvation. To the family and to him.
If this hadn't happened just as it did, everyone would have been lost. If this didn't happen just as it did, everybody would be lost. Physically lost and lost in sin spiritually. Only because Joseph was rejected, sold into slavery, and because of awful things that happened to him, would Joseph himself be, be saved from himself and from his pride. If this did not happen to Joseph, this guy would become really spoiled and, 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 and bad person. But through troubles and challenges, he was saved from himself. What about brothers? In the same way, this was the only way how his brothers would be saved from their hate and from turning into violent people. Wow. God working behind the scenes and bringing them <clears throat> to really good resolution. But he seemed absent. When they needed him most, he wasn't there. But he was all along, all along, working towards it in a beautiful way. So what we learn is that God's redeeming love is compatible with bad things that happen to us. God's love was active in his hiddenness and apparent absence in silence. So when you pray, God may answer your prayer as you ask, but when you pray, God may not answer it as you pray. That still doesn't mean that he won't answer it. God works all things together for good to those who love him. Do you love him? Even when he seems to be absent, do you believe that he can save you from the mess you found yourself or your family finds itself? Do you believe that? I'm glad you're here today. Let's finish with this. The hidden displays of God's grace. Almost every pain and suffering that comes into my heart has the potential to completely ruin me and completely ruin my soul. But when suffering comes into my life, I can also get something that will see me through it. And that's the coat. You see, one thing that, that kept Joseph and gave him sanity was the fact that his father loved him. Yeah? My dad loves me. My dad loves me. That special coat that brought trouble but also gave him assurance that he's loved. That he's loved. In the midst of my suffering, God gave me a token in assurance that he loves me. When did he make a coat for us? That in your trouble, you can always remember that token, that you have this coat. You see, when you join suffering and pain with Father's love, this makes you into a better, wiser, and happier person. Pain and suffering on their own can destroy you. But pain and suffering plus the assurance of God's love can turn you into somebody special. But you need the coat. You need the coat. You need the coat. When suffering comes, we see that God has... See, that's a problem. When suffering comes,
comes, we feel that God has abandoned us. But the solution, if we have a father's coat, we can handle it and we can endure it. We need it. Joseph needed it when he felt rejected, when he was sold, when he was stripped of it, when he was abandoned. Jesus needed it when hanging on the cross. And when the darkness was there, he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? Even Father's love didn't seem to be there anymore. At least Joseph could rely on that love in his imagination. But when the darkness covered the cross, and when he had to drink that cup, that meant a separation as wide as hell. Father's love was not there in any tangible way. He went through the hell. You and I never, never have to go through that hell. Why he did this is to give us a tangible coat that when you and I go through tough times, we can feel comfortable in that love of God. Amen. Jesus didn't have it, but you and I have it. Joseph involuntarily turned into a savior of one human fam family. But Jesus voluntarily turned into a savior of the whole human family. Well, my prayer is when you see and you think seemingly God is absent from your life, that you have a coat and the assurance of his love in spite of the pain that you're going through. And at least at the back of your mind, know that God is doing something. You might not even see what. To bring things into order. Through relationships. He will work on it. So that the salvation of your family, of yourself, will be full and complete. People out there, will continue to say that God is not doing a good job, people. He's not there when you need him the most. But your life needs to be a testimony that that is not the case. Not because you won't go through pain and suffering, but because you will. But the coat of God Code of the Lamb of God will be on you as a token and assurance that His love is sufficient for you and that He will see you through and save you within your life's problems as well as for the eternity. Amen.